Hello ladies and gentlemen, this is Kevin Element from the Interactive Media Development Program at Confederation College. I'm going to put together a little video to help my students understand a very important animation exercise uh, that a lot of animation students do all over the world. Uh, hopefully the world out there at large can learn from this as well. Um, the topic at hand is about the bouncing ball exercise. and There's a reason why this exercise is so important. Um, so many different aspects of animation, including character animation, has to deal with this topic. And if you watch carefully when you're looking at characters move through the world, uh, their heads and their bodies actually bounce in a, a way that's got acceleration and deceleration. We refer to that as easing. And I'm just going to go through this process and look at how to make this bouncing ball exercise happen in three different ways. This is an assignment my students have to do in class. So maybe if you're out there in the world just learning along with us, um, you can uh, get some really good tips and pointers. Uh, we're going to be investigating the draw tools. We're going to be looking at the pen tool, very important tool out there. I always try to get my students to overcome their fears of the pen tool because it's super important in tools like Illustrator, Photoshop, you name it. It's everywhere. People, Bezier curves rule our world. Um, let's get started. Okay, so first of all, I just want to point out a URL. That's very important uh, for our good fine folks out there. It's the angryanimator.com. And I use this um, throughout my learning in motion graphics. Uh, I used it myself when I was coming up the ranks, learning more and more about the traditions of character animation. And uh, if you visit that URL and look carefully at the link that says tutorials, um, you'll find a list of wonderful things that this person has put out in the world for free. Um, we're going to be looking later on at the walk cycle, but for today, we're specifically looking at the bouncing ball. There's lots and lots we can learn from this website, and specifically what I need from this person here is this image right here, because he breaks down all of the critical frames that are required uh, to make this uh, bouncing ball experiment work. So first thing I'm going to do is just right click on this image, I'm going to save the image as. I'm going to put it up here on my messy desktop where I have a lot of stuff on the go and I'm just going to call it my ball. It's a good name. I'm going to save it up. Look over to Flash Professional. Now I'm in 2015 CC but this is going to be working for all of you that still have a version of Flash MX from the old days when Macromedia was on the scene. Um, yeah, let's get started. So I'm looking specifically at producing an action script 3 file. So I'm going to fire that up. I'm going to be responsible. First thing I want to do is I want to save as. And on my desktop, like I said, it's cluttered and I have a lot of projects on the go. I am going to be diligent, make myself a new folder, and I'm going to call this Bouncing Ball. Now, my students have a very specific name for this folder that's up on our assignment list, and I always test them to make sure they're making really good choices. And you might notice that I'm using what's called camel casing. So the first word is lowercase, and every word after that is going to be uppercase. So ball is uh, in uh, capital B and uh, that's just really good naming convention so that you know that this file is going to work on all operating systems including Linux and Unix and I could even put it on the web and never have any fears. So I'm going to create this and inside that I'm going to call this my bouncing ball and hit save. Now my students once again you've got a very specific name that you have to call this and I'm going to be testing you on that and it's not bouncing ball so you've got to read that documentation up on Blackboard and make sure everything's tickety-boo. Okay, so I'm going to hit save, and I'm going to get started here. <clears throat> and if I go over to Finder, look up on my desktop, I've got this JPEG sitting there waiting for me. I gave it a good name, so I should be able to find it. I'm just going to open it up in Preview, fantastic tool, and I'm just going to use this as a guide to help me discover exactly what the size is. So I'm going to choose a just size, and this thing's 590 by 369. I'm going to keep those numbers in mind when I go back to Flash and make some of the most critical decisions that I'm going to make in the entire project. This is the first thing you guys want to consider whenever you make a new file. When you start off, you're going to be looking at this white space here, and this white space that I'm putting my mouse on and wiggling it around, that's called your stage. It's very important to understand that the stage is really just an object. And you can do research on the object model, uh, object-oriented programming to learn about how objects have properties, methods, and events. And this important word is right here, up here in the top right-hand corner of Flash. And we're looking at the documents properties. And specifically down below, if we look carefully, oh, there's properties relating to the stage. 
So what was that size again? Let me zoom back out and I get a triple check, go to back to preview, 590 by 369. So let's set that up, 590 by 369, very important. Now I'm gonna zoom in and out, I'm gonna hold the command key, you could do this with control. If you, if you ever hear me say command, I'm talking about the Mac, but the control key on the PC is uh, synonymous. So command two, the number two, command one is 100%, command two will actually zoom the screen uh, to exactly what I wanna see. And I want the biggest uh, stage size that I can work with so I can be really, really accurate when I'm making my drawings. So let's look under here, under file, and we're going to import, not to the library, but we're going to import directly to the stage. And there's a really good shortcut key to memorize because you're going to be importing a lot of assets. Command R or Control R. So I'm going to import this to the stage. It's going to ask me what file I want to bring in. And up here on my desktop, I've got this uh, file called ball somewhere. And there it is. Boom. And because I made it the exact same size, wow, look at that. It snapped right into place. That's awesome. So I'm going to zoom in down here just to talk about the timeline a little bit. I'm going to double click right here where it says layer one, and I'm going to say uh, this is my tracing layer. This is very important because I'm going to ask the software when I export this final movie to ignore this layer. And there's a property of this layer that I can get into. If I look very, very carefully, I'm going to right click, and down here it says properties. And up here I can say I want to make this thing a what I want to make it a what a mask a fold no I want to make it a guide layer and by simply making it a guide layer and locking it that means when I export this final SWF or if I'm trying to make an MOV for YouTube this layer will be ignored it's awesome it's just a way that we can trace our artwork and leave those expensive big files behind I'm gonna hit OK and down here look at the anatomy of the timeline here we got this little page button that's gonna help me to make a new layer this one's not locked and it's visible, that's great. And this is where I'm gonna be putting uh, my ball. Let's do that. So I need a bunch of frames and I'm gonna count real quick. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So 32 frames. I might make a mistake here, but that's fine. I wanna be out here at about 32 frames. So I'm gonna draw a lot of key frames into here so I got to be really careful so I'm going to click on the first frame I'm holding the mouse down the left mouse button I click and I hold that down and if I accidentally select one frame I got to put my mouse down here and deselect it by clicking off in this dark gray area it's, it's a very important thing about flash so I need to click and hold and drag all at one fell swoop and get out here somewhere I think that's 32 that'll be good let go and then I'm going to uh, right click and I'm going to choose from all of these wonderful options here I'm going to insert a frame that's going to give me a region of frames that's a good word right region of frames that I can work in and we look closely and I've covered this in another video before but right here it says that I've got this empty dot and I've got this other dot here and these are really important because these are key frames right this is where artwork exists and it's going to persist over this region of time here. So this artwork is actually going to be exposed for the entire 32 frames, which is really cool. Now this one here, it's hollow. And what does that mean? It's just visually telling me that I haven't put any artwork in there yet. Now I'm going to be drawing a lot of art, right? A lot of artwork in here. So I got to tell the system that from here to over here, and I click and drag, right? Click with the left mouse button and drag as I go and let go, now I can right click and I can convert these uh, to keyframes. That's interesting. I'm going to make all of these things into empty uh, places where I can put my artwork. Now I can hop in on frame one and this is important. I got to tell Flash, you know, Flash, you don't know where you are right now. The playhead sitting over here at 32 and I need to draw something in frame one. So we have to be very methodological, methodological, methodical. There it is. We got to be very methodical and tell Flash we're going to go here, click on frame one, and we're going to draw some artwork there. So let's look at some of our tools over here for doing illustration. Well, I got these circles and squares and stuff, and okay, I could try to draw a perfect circle, but you know what? Luckily, I'm living uh, in 2015, and this is awesome, and I got this circle tool, and that's great. And uh, I can you know look at the properties once again. Everything I draw and create in Flash is actually going to be an object, and I'm thinking like an object-oriented programmer and that's cool. Um, 
I'm going to make an object that's a circle. And what style do I want? Do I solid? Do I want to have an outline that's dashed? Like, look at all these wicked options. And I actually don't want there to be a stroke around this at all. So I can actually go up here where the little pencil is. And this is my outline. I don't want to outline this. I'm going to turn it off. And that's what this little uh, square with a red slash through is all about. And this one over here is neat. I can pick a fill color. But look what Flash has done. They're really cool. They gave us a gradiated a uh, circle gradient, a radial gradient. That's neat. So I'm going to choose that and I'm just setting up the properties of my tools before I start to draw so I don't have to do this work in the future and that's really really helpful. Now over here I'm looking down here on my timeline I'm being very methodological and I'm going to click on frame one here and I'm going to tell the system that up here I'm going to draw some artwork and I'm just going to hold down the shift key while I click and drag and Look at what Flash does. It's super awesome. It helps me to uh, draw that circle just perfectly. Now, I got some repositioning to do, and to do that, I got to select the object, and I got to get this selection tool over here so I can, you know, pick that up, and this really interesting hash marked pattern pops up, and that's just a visual cue to let me know that this thing is ready uh, to be animated, or this thing's not ready to be animated, actually. This is telling me that it's just artwork. It's not a movie clip yet. And that's something we're going to come into later. That's just telling me that this is vector artwork on the stage. It's not ready to be animated yet. But in the meantime, I can position it where I want. And I'm using my arrow keys left, right, up and down. And I'm nudging this around because it's a computer and I can nudge things around. And that's really great. And I'm not really satisfied with this gradient. So I wonder if there's a tool over here that I can utilize and Maybe I got to do some digging around. You know, I got to look around. I don't know the environment perfectly, or do I? Who knows? I got to find out how I can recreate this gradient. So I select this thing called the paint bucket tool. Interesting. And the paint bucket is carrying on the previous property that I set up for that circle, and it's showing me this gradient here. So maybe if I click on this object over here and drag, wow, look at that. That's really cool. Right? I can move this thing around. I can actually move the uh, center point of my gradient and maybe create the illusion that this thing is actually uh, spheroidal. And make this thing look like a sphere. That's pretty cool. I wonder if there's even more tools that we can use to dress up this gradient even more. Well, let's leave it like that for now. And one thing I love to do is to talk a little bit about this library over here. This is where all our art assets end up. And right now there's nothing in there because this is just vector art sitting out on my desktop here. It's living on my stage and it's great. It's looking pretty, but I want to work with this thing over and over and over again. And I can make instances of this object. I can instantiate this object from my library over and over again. There's a good word, instantiate the object from my library over and over. And I'll show you what I mean. I'm going to right click on this and in order to make it into an object, I have to cast it into something that flashes a strange word they've used for a very, very long time. And they, they want things converted to symbols. Now, I almost wish that they had said convert to object because that would make it seem a little bit more like a professional uh, object-oriented programming language, but they're thinking that we're more artists, so they're using the word symbol, and that's fine. They can't change it now. This is like back to the 90s when they started using this application. Um, when they created it, they called it symbols, and that's just the way it's been forever. So. What would be a good name? I'm gonna I'm gonna make it a movie clip. So I'm you know I'm thinking ahead. I, I want to be organized in the future. So I want this thing to be an MC. I'm gonna keep camel casing in mind. So MC ball. I'm thinking like a programmer. I might want to program this ball later. Wink wink. Nudge nudge. And this ball over here. I want to register it somehow. What does this mean? This is actually the center point of the object and where it's gonna rotate around, where it's gonna be transformed from. So let's put it on the floor because the ball is gonna inevitably bounce on the floor and I'll show you what that means here in a second I gotta tell it what type you know is it a button no it's a graphic that's confusing movie clips people are single-handedly the most powerful objects in the entire collection and the reason why is because we can program these things uh, using wonderful methods and events later on and uh, things like graphics eh, not so much there's a reason for graphics but we want it to be a movie clip let's just uh, trust the professor I'm a curious guy. What advanced stuff do I got down here? We can export this for action script. Well, that's neat. Maybe later on I want to use this in another program, or maybe I want to have an externally linked action script file. That's cool. Runtime share. Oh, this is really confusing. And we're just we're just animators right now, so we're just going to turn off advanced. And maybe in an upcoming tutorial we'll talk about what's going on in this 
uh, scary world right here. Not scary. It's fun. It's all good. We're all good, but it's uh, it's, it's complicated. So advanced, we'll just leave that closed. We're going to register on the floor. It's a movie clip. It's got a great name. I'm going to hit OK. And for the first time, we're going to see an object appear over here in our library. Now, that's cool. MC Ball, there it is. We got the GIF. Right on. We got some stuff in here we could reuse. We can reinstantiate. We could use it over and over again and not increase the file size of our project. That's pretty cool. Now, the rest of the step is pretty much a mechanical one. So I'm just going to take us to the point where we squish the ball down below. And I think everyone will get a sense of how they can complete the rest of this so I don't waste anyone's time. Um, I'm, I really do appreciate um, you know, your time. And uh, let's get down to it. So I'm putting my mouse down here on frame one. And I want to copy this object from frame one to frame two. Now, I could highlight the object and I could copy and paste it. That would be cool. But watch this trick. On the Mac, it's going to be different on the PC, and I'm going to leave it up to you smart people to figure out what that keystroke is on our good old PC partner. But I'm going to hold down the Option key, and I'm going to click on this keyframe, and I'm going to drag it over here. Look at that. It just duplicated the keyframe. Now, it didn't duplicate the artwork in frame one because it's coming out of the library. We only have one instance of this object called Ball, so it's actually the exact same data that's on our hard drive, and that's really cool. So I'm going to move this down over here. That's pretty cool. I'm um, going to zoom back out and just scrub the timeline. That's a good expression. When I move this playhead down here back and forth, that's called scrubbing the timeline. That's an old uh, editing term, and that's pretty good to know because when you're out there in the industry and you want to sound like you know what you're talking about, you want to use all the right terms, right? You want to scrub the timeline. So I'm going to scrub over to frame two, and we can see that we got some motion happening, and that's really exciting. So I'm going to skip over to frame three, and I'm going to do this a different way just to prove a point. I'm going to reach up over here into my library, over here where this ball is looking beautiful up here, and I've got my library chosen. I'm just going to drag it back out. Now you might think that what I'm doing here is actually making more file size, but I'm not because guess what? It's only one object in my uh, library, and I can instantiate that object over and over again, and I can save file size that way. That's really cool. I'm going to scrub over to frame four, and I'm going to do it a totally different way. I'm going to go down here where it says MC Ball, and I'm going to try to drag that out and put that here. Neat. There's all these different ways. Maybe I'm going to go up under Edit, Copy, and then on frame five, I'm going to edit. Watch this one. This is incredible. I'm going to paste it in place. How many times have you tried to copy something and put it down exactly where you picked it up from? Well, most of these tools now have something called paste in place. Illustrator calls it paste in front. So I'm going to choose that option. And look, it put it down exactly where I copied it from. Now we're in a weird situation here because this circle is no longer uh, perfect. It's actually become uh, ovular. Interesting. So how am I supposed to deal with that problem? Well, there's another wonderful tool over here in our library. We got this thing called the free transform tool. I'm going to select that one. That's pretty cool. And then, oh, there they are. Those are all those interesting little handles that pop up that allow me to squish and stretch and do all this fun stuff. And that's cool. And if I'm really patient, I'm going to zoom in real close and I put my mouse over that it says I can do that with it. I can stretch it up and down. That's neat. Over here, I can stretch it left and right. I can change its property. I can change the object's property of width and height, W and H. Wait a second, W and H. If I go back to my properties collection over here, whoa, wait a minute, that's cool, X, Y. That's where it is from the top to bottom and the side to side, but the width and height, look at that. Actually, I wonder if I can just grab this number and squish it this, oh, cool. I just carefully look where my cursor is doing. The hand's got some arrows. That's weird. And I can click and drag and just change this integer value with something called a spinner. And I can spin that value and I can be really accurate. Or maybe I can just double click right on that and say I want to make that 40. Now, this isn't the right answer. We're animating here, right people? These numbers can change and you got to use your eyes, right? You got to use your, uh, you have to use your, your, your sense of taste to decide what's the right answer. The height is going to be something else, and I can spin it and squish it, and look at how it's bouncing off of the bottom. Isn't that interesting? Notice how it's stuck to the bottom. That's because when we created the movie clip, that little registration tool, right? we chose the bottom middle option. That's interesting. We floored it. We put it on the floor. So now we can squish this thing up and down, and we're already starting to see a little bit of cool animation happening. So I could type a number in here. I could say 47, 46, I don't know. 
I'm using my creative brain. And then I'm going to zoom in close again, once again with my transform tool selected. And I'm going to watch this cursor very carefully. I can go up, down. I can go left, right. What's this guy? What's that guy? What's that arrow talking about? What's this guy? That's, that's weird. What's that? That's skew. I can skew this thing. Right? I don't want to do that, though. I just want to point it out that it's there. But there's another one that's very important that we're going to need here. If I put my cursor just outside, we get this little weird circle uh, with this arrow beside it, and that's rotate. Right? So these are all translations, right? transformations that we're doing. And I'm going to be smart. I'm going to look at those little middle buttons right here and here, these little icons that represent the, the scaling tool. And I'm going to watch to line them up with these dotted lines. I can use that. It's very powerful. It's snapping right now. That's, that's good. But maybe I don't want snap to be turned on. I'm going to leave it up to your creative brains to look around in the interface to find snap. Maybe I can just go up here to help. Right? Help is interesting. Help's got this great thing on a Mac where we hit search. We, we, said we highlight that and we're going to go snap. Snap. Snapping. And look what Mac does. This is really cool. As I'm going up and down the help system, it's actually pointing to things. So I know that it's under view, snapping. I'm going to turn all the snaps off. I don't need it for this project. Snap. I don't want this thing snapping to a rotation of 10 degrees or whatever it's doing, 15 degrees. So I'm going to turn off snap align. I'm going to go under edit. I'm going to go under snapping. This is going to, might take a little bit of time. Where was that? View. I can't remember. So guess what? I'm going to go back to help. Help, help, help. Help me. And I'm going to type that in again. Snap. Okay. Snap to grid. Help. Help. Help me. Snap to a lot. Snap to grid. That's turned off. What about snap to guides? And where was that again? That was under, oh, view. I'm learning. Everyone's still learning. We never stop learning. So I'm going to turn off snap to objects. And now when I zoom in here and look really, really close, that's pretty cool. It's no longer snapping to any degree. So I can be very accurate. We want to be very accurate when we're doing this. Now, I know that I put this on my clipboard, right? Because back here in frame four, I highlighted the object and it said edit copy. Now we'll look at how copying and pasting works a little bit differently when we don't ask Flash to paste in place, but instead we're going to say paste in center. We're just going to put it right in the center of our stage. Okay. Did I do that right? Let's go back one frame. Yeah, that one's still skewed and rotated. Sorry, not skewed. Its height and width properties were changed and its rotation property was changed, but I did not skew it. Let's be very clear with our terminology here. So I'm going to skip over to six where I pasted this right in the center and I'm going to zoom up. I'm going to be very careful. I'm going to select my object. I still have my free transform tool on. Wait a minute. I need to know my shortcut keys. Let me mouse over this for a second and look carefully. On the Mac, free transform tool can be brought up by just tapping the Q key. And that's really important to know because after a while we're just going to get into hardcore mode Sounds funny, right? Hardcore mode? That's actually what they call it in 3D Studio Max. Hardcore mode, where all your tools disappear, and because you're hardcore, you can just use your shortcut keys. That's interesting. So I'm going to drag this down to where I think I need it. I'm going to stretch it out. I'm going to squish it. And then I'm going to rotate it a bit. This might take some time. And notice how the registration points all around this, they, they, they stay in rotation. So I can still scale. Because that's a, that's a property. That's the H property, that's the height property. And this one over here is the width property. That's pretty cool. And I can even nudge it with a pixel perfect accuracy of my keys and I can rotate it a little bit more. And then over here on the last frame, I'm going to scoot down. I'm going to scrub the timeline over to frame. What is that frame? How do I know what frame I'm on? Oh, cool. Look what Flash has got. It's got a little indicator down on the bottom that tells me exactly what current frame I'm on. Super handy. We'll come back to this in a second. And I have scrubbed over to frame seven. I can see that the keyframe is hollow. It's receiving artwork that I'm going to paste down by simply pasting in place. And that's a command V or a control P on PC. I'm going to get our shortcut keys going here. Um, move this into place as best I possibly can. I don't think I need to rotate anymore, but I do need to stretch it on its width value and its height value. All right. So we've done a lot here. And it's pretty, pretty fast. I'm going to cut right now and uh, come back to another video to talk about how to do this a different way uh, using Bezier curves with the pen tool. And that's really great. But, you know, I like to test along the way. I'm going to hit Command Return. 
or control return on your PCs, command return is going to bring up this, the flash player and it's like, whoa, 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 that's really, really, really fast. Oh, wait a minute. I didn't consider one of the most important properties of the stage of the of the document when I started the file. Let me just look at that for a second. And I'm going to not click on the artwork in here, but I'm going to click out in this dark area just to make sure I'm telling Flash I've deselected everything and I'm actually talking about the document itself. And look, the properties over here change. Look at my FPS, my frames per second. How fast am I going to see each image per second? Well, not 24. That's maybe 12. Well, we know something that the illusion of animation actually doesn't really work below 12 FPS. And then 16 FPS became popular in the history of animation. Now we're up at 24, but I've got a lot of frames flying by here. So I'm going to I'm going to half the time by dividing 24 by 2, and there we are. We got 12, and now I'm going to test it again by hitting command return. Okay, we're getting somewhere. Okay. It's a little bit more jittery, and that's okay. Maybe in, in time what we'll do is we'll, we'll try to expose the frames a little bit longer. Um, but I think this is looking pretty good. So I'm going to leave it at that. And you guys go ahead and finish off the rest. And it might take you a little bit more time. You know, I'm uh, 10,000 hours into using Flash. I started back in 96. So I can call myself a master of my craft. And I'm really proud of that. And that's why I get to teach now at the age of 42. And uh, yeah, I'm having fun. And hopefully, hopefully you guys are having fun too. And uh, do me one thing, people. Uh, embrace the frustration. Embrace the failure. Musicians understand this. Musicians always, always suck when they start playing a musical instrument. But how do they get good? They play for 100, 500, 1,000, 10,000 hours. And that's how we get to become masters of our craft. Never forget to save. Save, save, save. I'm going to do that. And I'm going to take a little break here and I'm going to come back for round two.